President Xi Jinping calls for China to up its game in international communications, to tell China's story well and to disseminate China's voice well. This is especially important for the ruling party of China, the Communist Party of China, the CPC, the party, now celebrating its 95th anniversary. Most foreigners do not understand the party, what it stands for, how it's structured, how it functions. But one cannot understand China without understanding the party. So how can the party tell its story? A good way is to look to the future. What challenges does the party face? What dangers? Getting to know the party's concerns gets us closer to China. In general, from my activities, uh, there's not that much appreciation uh, in foreign markets for the party. Uh, how, how do you see the importance of understanding, for understanding China to understand the party and how it works? I think people here have to uh, look at the CPC in a way that is different from the way they look at normal political party in the West. Because the CPC has been the ruling party in China for over six decades. But it maintains its close ties with the people. It has its roots in the people. It is always trying to respond to the people's aspirations and needs, always try to innovate, to, to keep up with the uh, growth of China, the changes in the world. So this is a, a very mature party, but at the, same, at the same time, it's still a very young party because the thinking is always moving forward. Understand about the party is something that's really new. The party in the past has not reached out to the world the way it is doing now. Uh, how do you interpret that? What, why is it happening now and what's the significance of it? Well, actually, I would say that the CPC party has never been a secret. It's a, peop it's a party for the people and uh, by the people and uh, of the people. And uh, however, because China has just you know, opened up recently, uh, actually, China has only opened up over the past uh, 30 years or so. That's why I think it's natural that people do not understand how China works and what is the government's uh, mode, uh, the style of uh, you know, running the country. Uh, so it does not mean that the party is a secretive party. It just means that there's not e enough information about the party that is being communicate communicated to the outside world. So today, I think it's also quite natural that as people wanted to understand more about China, they have to understand the government, they have to understand the party. Actually, uh, whether uh, you call it this uh, party or that party, I think for the government officials, for the party members, we are actually doing the same job as any uh, government. That is to say, trying to bring a better life for the people and trying to uh, be a responsible uh, stakeholder in the world and also try to uh, uh, bring a sustainable development for the country. This, I think, is important not only for the 1.3 billion Chinese people, but also very, very important for the world as a whole. So I think on this account, I think as China and the United States are building this important relationship, we should try to understand more of each other, whether it's economic development, social progress, uh, personal growth, uh, but also try to get more, get to know more about uh, the CPC, about the state leaders, and about the government officials. You see, economic growth and development are the focus of the Chinese Communist Party, no doubt. But I think there's another important focus, and that is the focus is on creating an inclusive growth. And I think there, there's been a tremendous success for the Chinese uh, Communist Party because I think nowhere in the history of the 20th century have we seen that many people below the poverty line being taken up above the poverty line. So economic growth in the final analysis means people's welfare. It's not just your growth statistics and figures. And, and that is where I think in a more equitable society there, there has been a lot of progress in China. But at the same time you also have inequalities inequity is coming, which the Communist Party of China is very, very aware of. I mean, in fact, it is the Communist Party of China that informs us 
and the world about the inequalities uh, and the widening uh, been sections of uh, the economic disparities and the efforts that are being, being made to bridge them. What's amazing about the Communist Party of China is that it's like a young man uh, with old mind. It's a young body and old minds. And uh, I think it's made incredible achievements. You, you, you just have to look at what's happened in China between 1921 and uh, today. Uh, you can only have the greatest of respect for the minds and the capability of organizing delivery of the Communist Party of China. But you know, it's just beginning. What's happened has happened. What Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party has to be concerned about is what will happen. How to take care of the future. How to bring um, sustainability to China. How to take care of the environment. Most important of all is Xi Jinping's guiding um, philosophy uh, to listen to the people to take care of the people of China. Because without that, nothing will work. And you can see that uh, the Communist Party of China gets that power is only worth having if you deliver for the people what they need and what they want. I think it's one of the remarkable achievements in the 20th century and the 21st century. The peaceful rise, the development of China. I'll just give you one statistic which sums it up, that within a generation after the policies of reform and opening up uh, initiated by uh, His Excellency Deng Xiaoping, within one generation of that, 25 years, 600 million people, Chinese people, were taken out of poverty. After that period, the second major development is that China has overtaken Japan as the world's second biggest economy, second only to the United States of America. So these are just developments in the last 30 years. The American public begin to, or the American administration begin to understand the party's mechanisms. What can we do from both sides to improve communications? I think for, uh, for the American side, perhaps people should get rid of the uh, old mindset. Try to be open, try to have a good understanding of China's history, culture, how, how China has developed, how China has evolved over thousands of years, and what are the real needs of the Chinese people today, and what China is going to do today and tomorrow. And for the Chinese side, I think we have to do a much better job of publicity. We have to do our best to let people know especially the American people, to facilitate their understanding of China. And we have to tell the Chinese story in a much more effective way. China thinks democracy in a much broader sense in terms of serving the people, etc. So how would you define or explain the, the nature of democracy in China? What the goal is? Not perfect, granted. Well, I would say that probably the, uh, the formation of the party system is different, but that does not mean that it is not a de democracy. For example, we also have democratic parties that work together with the uh, Chinese Communist Party. And also within the Communist Party, we have uh, departments that in a way serve as a check and balances. Uh, to the leadership, to the party officials. So we have our own system of democratic, uh, you know, formation. So as I mentioned, that this system might not be the same as the American system. Actually, if you look at all the uh, different uh, political systems, the Europeans are not the same as American. Uh, the Africans were the, some of the Asian countries have a different kind of uh, democracy or governance than the Americans. But I think what is also important, you see, is, is to know what it really works. I think if the system works for China, works for the Chinese people that, you know, makes the China, uh, Chinese society make progress. Uh, I think, you know, that shows that it is the right system for China. Uh, for example, over the past uh, 30 years or so, we have lifted over 600 million people out of deep poverty. I think if a society, a government can do this, it shows the efficiency of this government. 
uh, the effectiveness of the government. So I think whether you know the system, whether you call it uh, whatever system is right or not, it depends on the result it produces and whether it's a, uh, adaptable to the, its own situation. In the past, in my observation, the party has not wanted to talk about itself not because it was, it, it, was, it was deliberately secretive, but because they thought people wouldn't understand or wouldn't be relevant. But that created the, the, the feeling in people's minds that it was something malevolent and, or, and something that is, uh, is uh, conspiratorial. Uh, so, it, 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 you know, the, people will have one motivation and, and then others judge it exactly the opposite. So how do you begin to break through this? I think one of the ways to do it is to be specific in given situations. For example, if there is a party secretary in a, in a, in a uh, company, in a state-owned company, what's his role versus the role of the chief executive? Explain how does it work, okay? If it's a, a, a party secretary at a university, what's his role versus the president, versus the faculty? If people understood that on a specific basis, they would then know you know, what the relation, it, this is not like the Wizard of Oz, you know, who calls the things and behind the curtain, but that's what people think. It's been very difficult for people in China originally, in the early days, to understand the president versus the Congress. So the president comes and says, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to put this policy order, and he comes back and he can't do it. You know, and how come? He said, you know, <laughs> oh, well, you know, we have a congressional division of party, and so you have to understand how it works. And it's the same thing in China, that people in outside of China need to understand how it works, okay? And there's very little understanding of that. So then the terminology, the labels, become all important. One of the things that impresses me about the current structure of the CPC is its emphasis on personnel, selecting people, monitoring them, training them at various times in their careers. Um, what, from your experience as an international diplomat in, in many countries, and knowing the system in China, uh, what would you want to communicate to the world about the way China builds and trains its officials and leaders that work with the people in China? Well, I would say that the CPC party is a very mature party. So over the years, it has gained a lot of experience in uh, training and also selecting the best officials, the best people that can run the country. Uh, as people understand that China is a very uh, complex society and it's really not easy to run a, a country of uh, 1.3 billion people. So you really need people, the leaders, who have to know the Chinese situation. So it's like President Xi Jinping. He has worked from the very, uh, you know, village, started out from village. He was a village head and he actually has not missed one step in the government. So he actually you know, worked in the, in the village, in the county, in the city, and in the province, and, uh, and then became uh, a member of the standing committee of the CPC. So you need uh, these years of experience, uh, of working experience, and also uh, of, uh, you know, in the government, actually working in the government, to know your ways out. And I think, you know, this is very important. So uh, we have had this process of, uh, you know, training the programs. Actually, this is, I would say, uh, one of the successes of the uh, government. Uh, for example, China has only opened up to the outside world for 36 years. But I believe, if I'm not uh, uh, mistaken, that all the, uh, mem all the uh, government officials above the county level have been uh, uh, going through, have gone through some trainings, and also they have all been abroad, visiting different countries and getting some kind of, uh, you know, lectures or, or training courses, or programs uh, outside of China. And that is very, very important. I think that is also a very strong commitment because that shows that our government is very uh, firm in saying that China should not only be China itself, you should also be part of the world, you must integrate into the world. So they have made a very strong uh, commitment to train the people to open up their um, horizons, uh, so to speak, so that they not only understand the Chinese situation, but also understand what's going on in the world.
It seems that in the last year or two, the CPC has made uh, uh, novel efforts to tell its story to the world. Uh, how do you see this evolution where in the past the party, at least to the outside world, was looked upon as very secretive and then maybe only communicating with similar parties in other countries? Uh, but in recent years, it, the party seems to now want to tell its story more broadly to the world. Uh, how do you account for this transformation? At present, more than 600 political parties all over the world have frequent communication with the CPC. Exchanges like this are quite helpful because they give the party opportunities to introduce itself to other parties so that they can understand the CPC more. Foreign parties are also willing to communicate as they can learn new things by understanding the CPC. Different parties, ruling parties in particular, share many similarities in party building. Therefore, the ever more frequent inter-party communication over the recent years has produced increasingly positive results. The CPC has also opened up more to the foreign media, as their coverage usually carries great weight on their country's readers and audience. So as China becomes more influential on the global stage, more and more foreign journalists are turning their attention to China. In response, the CPC also becomes more open towards them. For example, the CPC has invited some journalists from the foreign media to visit the party school of the CPC Central Committee, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection of the CPC, the Organization Department, and the Publicity Department of the CPC Central Committee, all of which used to be very mysterious to the outside world. Now they're all opening up. Officials also take questions from the journalists. Sometimes even leaders come out for interviews. More so, the party's liaison organization, the International Liaison Department of the CPC Central Committee, has started organizing press conferences on the party's important meetings or major policy measures. I believe all these different forms of communication serve to better introduce the CPC to the world. This will turn out to be very fruitful for our publicity. From your personal experience in dealing with foreign political parties or even foreign media, what do you think are the biggest misconceptions about the party? To be fair, Western reporters, particularly those based in Beijing, pay close attention to a wide range of topics. Of course, they might follow political issues with greater interest than economic ones, as the economy is easier to understand. But regarding politics, China varies a great deal with other countries. If my memory serves me right, someone asked about the legal system in China. General Secretary Xi Jinping, as top leader of the CPC, emphasized the importance of strengthening the party's leadership over legal work. But foreign reporters could not really understand the meaning of the move. The ruling party's leadership over the work of the judiciary never makes a problem in Western countries. So I needed to explain what makes China's situation unique. China's legal system was gradually built after the CPC's founding of the People's Republic. In the past, there were many problems. Before reform and opening up, loopholes caused serious consequences. Later, CPC leaders realized the significance of the legal system and conscientiously strengthened and improved the law. This is well indicated in the work they did. Legislation, law execution and implementation by government departments, the judiciary and party committees, and law abiding by the public, all these need promotion and supervision. The CPC is the only power capable and reliable to accomplish that goal. Therefore, in my view, the reason General Secretary Xi Jinping highlighted the party's leadership over judiciary work is that he wants to ask the party cadres, especially the senior ones, to take the lead in abiding by the law and promoting legal development in a well-rounded way. I believe that emphasis is well-grounded on China's national conditions and can benefit the legal framework. I'm confident that through a proper explanation of China's national conditions, foreign reporters will show more understanding. At the 2015 Book Expo America, a series of five books titled China Today, Understanding the Communist Party of China was published in English by the Party Building Books Publishing House. 
It was the first time that the CPC reached out in this manner to explain how the party works, its philosophies, policies, and challenges. The CPC books were a milestone, confirming that for the world to understand China, it must understand the CPC. If we look to the future and if American uh, uh, diplomats or administration ask you, what is the party's mission for China's future? What is the answer? I think to put it in a very simple way, the party's mission is to accomplish the modernization of the Chinese civilization. As President Xi said in his book, I think that was his first statement when he became General Secretary of the party. He said, people's wish for good life is our goal. I think this best summarizes his thinking about China's future. And one of these goals for the Communist Party, the ruling party, is for a Chinese democracy. That's, that's a goal that is, yes. a, and this is, an, I think, an important statement to make, what that means, uh, but, but it is an affirmative statement. This is not just lip service or just using a word to impress people. There's real intensity about making that happen through various sources, use of internet, use of communications, uh, the, the people participating in governance. It's a process. Yes, it is a process. And I think, as you mentioned, I fully agree that the goal is to build a socialist democracy. Uh, I think that is uh, important because the, the ultimate goal, actually similar to the American goal, is to bring a better life for the people. Uh, so I sometimes um, uh, talk about the, the, the way we use uh, chopsticks or uh, fork and knife. I said, well, you know, we might be eating by uh, chopsticks and the uh, American people eating by uh, forks and knives, but it does not mean that the fork knives are more superior than the chopsticks. I think as long as we can eat our food and get the, the best food out of it, I think it's, it's, it's all right. In the more than nine decades since the founding of the CPC, China has weathered invasion, civil war, upheavals, chaos, and stunning growth. Yet now in the 21st century, the CPC faces new pressures in leading the world's largest population. China's economy and society have become highly complex with many problems. From imbalances to pollution, and through the internet and social media, almost everyone is aware of them. Based on the changes due to major influences, political, theoretical, over the last 65 years. Can you project forward in the new era, the modern era of globalization and the internet, what changes the party will need to make in the future? I In my opinion, as a political party, the CPC will keep up with the times. Its future naturally promises great prosperity and imagination. As you were talking about the Internet just now, I'd like to say that we're taking quite great moves in making use of the Internet. At the same time, we pay great attention to cybersecurity. I believe Mr. Snowden's leaking of highly classified materials have warned us of the potential threat this problem poses to China. So it's not only Americans, but also the Chinese who suffer from cyber insecurity. For example, we now have three major forces that threaten cybersecurity. Terrorists even use the Internet to incite extreme emotions. I think this is an issue of worldwide concern. Then there are cyber attacks. Hackers can be found everywhere. As the CPC wants to make good use of the Internet, we must give serious thought in finding a solution. This is shown by the fact that many party cadres taking advanced studies in our party school do their thesis on the topic of how to promote the sound development of the Internet to help in party building. We are all devoted to addressing this issue. In the meanwhile, we attach great importance to the impact the Internet has on governing the country with active research and analysis. Apart from exploring the potential of cyberspace, we are also promoting digital party building. This is another issue gripping our thoughts. Many party members in the local regions are making brief moves in advancing the party's digital development.
I also believe this is a trend in the future that can reduce problems in managing the current 86 million party members and increase efficiency by a big margin. From our vantage point here in mid-2016, what do you think are the biggest challenges for the party? What are some of the dangers it should look out for, pitfalls, threats, uh, as you look to the future? When Xi Jinping was first elected as General Secretary of the CPC in 2012, many foreign correspondents in Beijing reported on it. The most frequently covered topic in their first batch of writings was the challenge Xi Jinping faced. Some showed a very deep understanding. For example, they rated the drastic gap between rich and poor in China as one of the big challenges for him. They also touched on China's environment, air and water pollution, and etc. These are all problems Xi Jinping must address. Then there are challenges to China's economic development. As our economy slows down today compared to the past, many problems are brought to light, such as overcapacity and the economy's poor structure, which are all awaiting solutions. Moreover, challenges in people's livelihood are prominent. There are over one billion people in China. Some are leading a quality life, but others are still struggling in poverty. Some are troubled with issues like housing, children's schooling, medication, and health care. Xi Jinping has to take all these into consideration. Other people talked about challenges in the international community. As China grows stronger, there are theories about a China threat circulating in the world. Some people are not willing to see China developing at such a rapid pace. So how can General Secretary Xi protect China's core interests and develop friendly relations with neighboring countries and the whole world at large? This is another challenge to ponder on. Based on reports from foreign correspondents, I summarize eight challenges. I think each one is tough. The most important and critical one is the adjustment of the party whether the CPC can develop itself well and win over the people. The first thing to resolve is corruption within the party. Only with this heart not cracked will the people approve of the party. Therefore, General Secretary Xi Jinping is indeed facing grave challenges. That is why in the past three years, he has been dedicated to fighting corruption with an effort never seen before. The result is also quite rewarding. I think people are most satisfied with the anti-corruption efforts among all the work the Central Committee has done. But of course, the job has not been completed yet. Anti-corruption efforts are still a work in progress. Apart from severe punishment against corruption, the CPC also formulates regulations and disciplinary measures to prevent party cadres from being corrupt. I myself deem it the most challenging task of the CPC at the moment and I am fully confident about our success in this battle. For decades, international communications have been important for China. But now, with globalization and instant information, getting China's voice heard and message out is essential for China. So if the world does not understand the CPC, the party, the party should reach out to the world. And what better time than now on the 95th anniversary of its founding? Effective international communications require both robust substance and engaging style. For the party, substance means how well it faces future challenges assessed by economic transformation and social development. Style means how well the party tells its own story, measured by transparency, candor, confidence, sophistication, and wit. Watching the party communicate takes us closer to China.